Okay. Again, welcome to our Wednesday night small group study of the book of James. Uh, we are using uh, for our primary source the John MacArthur book, James Guidelines for a Happy Christian Life. And as a supplement, I'm using the Holman Commentary uh, of the book of James. In session one, we get a little talking about the background of James. Uh, it's believed to be the uh, oldest written book in the New Testament. It was written between about 44 and 49 A.D. based on uh, some evidence in the Acts, book of the Acts. It tells us some things that occurred. And 44 to 49 A.D. seems to be the window when it was written by the oldest half-sibling of Jesus Christ himself, his older older of his siblings brothers um, the book itself is a book of practical practices it's not really a book of theology it's a book that really talks about how to judge your Christian life um, session one began the study and throughout it James talks about a number of tests and the tests or test to kind of evaluate the genuineness of your faith. So whether or not your faith is actually genuine. And then secondly, it's a way to judge how fruitful your faith is. Some scholars have tried to make a conflict between Paul's writing and James's writing. Because Paul's writing draws a lot on... Um, justification not by works whereas James's book deals with works but really they're complementary because what James says in his book is if you have a genuine faith go to Paul faith through justification and the grace of God you're a believer then that should be reflected in your works so the two of them are actually complementary, not contradictory. So in session one, we talked about one of those tests. And the test that we talked about in session one was the test of trials. And if you'll remember Sunday, we started off in Genesis chapter 22, and we talked about Abraham and Isaac. Genesis 22, 1 begins by saying, God tested Abraham. And the difference here, in James, he's talking about God presenting trials or tests, but unlike um, tests that the devil may present, the tests that God presents, the trials that God presents, are meant to have a positive impact on our faith. They're meant to help us to grow in our faith. You remember we talked on Sunday. God knew exactly what Abraham was going to do. He knew that the test was not so much would Abraham be willing to sacrifice his son, but it was a test for Abraham to prove to himself that his faith in God was more important than anything else. Ooh. And that's basically what James is saying. How we respond to trials, how we respond to tests, how it helps us to grow in our faith, is a sign or a indication of the genuineness and fruitfulness of our faith. The second test that he presented was uh, about the middle of chapter 1, and it was the test that dealt with temptations. And again, it's kind of a similar thing. God doesn't bring temptations. If you'll remember uh, Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Temptations can come from Satan. Temptations come from our own natures. We all have things that would tempt us to do things that would reflect poorly on our Christian faith. The question again is, how do we respond to temptation? And then last week was the third test that James presented, and it was how do we respond to God's Word? Do we read and meditate on God's word? Do we use it as a guide for our lives as we go through our daily living? So those are three tests that he's presented. And then today, he presents a 
fourth test as we begin chapter two. And in chapter two, my uh, translation labels it the sin of favoritism. The sin of favoritism. If you look back in Matthew chapter 25, there is a very familiar parable that Jesus uses. It's the parable of the sheep and the goats. Um, favoritism. What do you do to reflect your faith in the world around you, particularly to those who are less fortunate? Now, I mentioned a minute ago we've been members of the church here for about 15 years. Vivian and I joined the church November 2009, I think it was. I'm trying to think here. I think it was nine. maybe seven. Time just kind of flies when you're having fun. But I remember as we came into the church, one of the things that impressed us was the things that First Baptist North Kansas City does to minister the community. So those of you that have been here for a long time, longer than me maybe, what are some things that you can think of where the church as a ministry has gone out into the community and done things? I'll give you one to start with. Every fall we do a back to school bash where we provide school materials for those who have trouble affording them. What else can you think of that is a ministry to those that are maybe less fortunate to us in the community. Christmas boxes. Christmas boxes. Christmas boxes. Thanksgiving and Christmas boxes or baskets. There used to be a bus ministry. Yeah. Used to be a bus ministry here years ago. Food no, pantry. Food pantry. I always liked the trunk or treat. We had okay. a lot of neighborhood foods yeah. and people. Trunk or treat. That. The grief share that brings people in. Uh, grief share that's going on right now with Darlene. We had church on the porch. Church on the porch. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have visitation. We we did, I used to come to that yeah. in the early 80s, mm -hmm. and we'd pray and they'd sort out. Church-wide visitation. Yeah, now I think not, visitation yeah. is pretty much done by the staff. Um, home front. Mm -hmm. It's ministry. Now. Homefront is now not directly related to the church, but it started out of the church. Uh, support for the Afghani refugees. And there are other things that you can name. I mean, you can go on and on and on and name things that people in the church here have felt a call to do to minister to those that maybe have less or have difficulties that we can meet. Now, face it. There is no way a church, I think I could say this pretty solidly, there's no way that a church can probably compete, and I use that word advisedly, with NGOs, non-government organizations, or other uh, charities that do a whole lot of fundraising from everybody to provide the funds for them to go out and provide support to people, United Way and that kind of thing. We can never do that. But there are things that we are capable of doing. When James talks about partiality or favoritism here in his book, he's talking about how God views people and how his people, believers, should view people. It's another test as to whether or not you have a genuine faith, and what is the fruitfulness of your faith? When we talk about partiality, the original word from the Greek basically gives the image of you're judging somebody on how they look. And if they look really good, and Paul or James uses that example here in the text tonight, if they look really good, successful, nice look, smart dresser, then they got better treatment than somebody who was poor and did not look all that desirable. And in his book, he says, basically, this is incompatible with your faith. You need to re-examine your faith to see if you need to change your actions. So we're in 
chapter 2 of the book of James, and we're looking at the first 13 verses. So chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. So starting off, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. So, Bev, yeah. you get the old NIV. We got the old antiquated version here. Favoritism forbidden is what mine's labeled. All right. My brothers as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. <clears throat> Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over here or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among, among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Okay. Yeah. In the whole one, verse 1 says, my brothers. Yeah. And again, he uses the term my brothers throughout the book of James. And he's basically saying, I'm talking to Jewish believers. And in the Jewish culture, the Jewish law, the Mosaic law, said you were supposed to take care of widows and orphans and the stranger within your gate. You were supposed to take care of those who were less fortunate. Evidently, that was not what was taking place here. So he says, my brothers, Hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ without showing favoritism. In verses 1 through 4 that we just read, James is basically saying to his readers, showing favoritism is inconsistent with the Christian faith. Amen. Christ came for everybody. I don't know how many times as a kid growing up, I heard pastors say the... Um, ground at the foot of the cross is flat. There's no hills or levels when it looks at believers. All believers are equal. Amen. When we look at the word glorious, words usually related to divinity. So he's starting off by saying, my brothers, you have faith, you have belief in the divinity of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I'm putting a therefore in there. You should not be showing favoritism. You should not be one who is courting the rich and ignoring the poor. And he goes on in verses 2 and 3 and gives an example of what he's talking about. So in verse 2, he says, For suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring, dressed in fine clothes, and a poor man dressed in dirty clothes also comes in. Well, the word for meeting here can mean synagogue. It can mean church. Later in the book of James, he actually uses the term church. Or it can be a house meeting. And if you think back again to the book of Acts, when the church met, many times they would meet in the courts of the synagogue. Or an alternative would be in a house church, or what we would today call a house church. Meet in somebody's home. Part of that was for safety's sake, particularly after the persecution started. But that was where the meetings took place. So we, you're having a meeting. You're having a church service. For us, we're in worship on Sunday morning. And a rich man comes in wearing a gold ring. Now, I really like the way the commentary talks about this. We read it, and it says, wearing a gold ring. Actually, in the original, it talks about wearing lots of gold rings. Your fingers are covered with gold rings. You got a necklace of gold around your neck. You showed off back then. If you had wealth, you showed it. So you had rings on your fingers and rings or necklaces. One of the commentaries says there were actually stores where you could gold rent rings if you wanted to impress somebody. You couldn't oh, afford a gold ring, you could rent one for the day. So status was important in this culture. So they're talking about somebody with lots of bling. You know that term? Yes. Lots of bling. And when it talks about fine clothes, the word actually means sparkly clothes, glittery clothes. In other words, he was a smart dresser. He looked like he was worth a million dollars. And then there's the poor man. 
He comes in and he's wearing dirty, and the word originally meant filthy clothes. Maybe he just came from work. Maybe it was all he had. I've mentioned a number of times in the past about the church we belong to in Nairobi, which on one side had a giddy community with wealthy, and the other side, one of the largest slums in the world, and everybody worshiped together. Some people in three-piece suits, and some people in dirty clothes, because that's all they had. And they and had no real okay. means of washing them. Sorry. That worked okay? It worked okay. Everybody got along, and we worshiped together. And they kept coming? And they kept coming, yep. Nobody said a word. James then says, if you look with favor on a man wearing fine clothes, you look for favor on the smart dresser, the rich guy, the guy who might be able to do some good for you, and you say to him, sit here in a good place. Well, if they were in a synagogue somewhere, the good place would be sitting at the front where you're close to the teacher. So you're a greeter in the synagogue or you're a greeter in our church. And the rich guy comes in and you take him down to the front row seat. No one as Baptist, we'd like to have the back row seat. So maybe we we'll give him the back row seat. Anyway, you give him the seat of prominence. And then the poor man, you say, stand over there. Go stand in the corner or sit on the floor. You don't pay attention any to his needs. You just ignore him. You're welcome, but we just ignore you. The rich man will fawn over. He might do us some good someday. But then he asks the question, haven't you discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Mm -hmm. Rhetorical question. Obvious answer yes. he's looking for is yes. yes. Amen. We have done two things that would, if you will, deny our faith. First, we have created divisions within the church. You look around today, there are enough divisions in the world. We don't need to add more in the church. If you treat the rich member one way and the poor member another way, you've created a divide in the church, or could have created a divide in the church. Even more, you have denied the fact that in Christianity, Christ has said we're all equal. The ground at the foot of the cross Amen. is flat. We all come to Christ by faith, not because we're rich, not because we're poor. We'll get more on that here in a minute. But we come because we have faith. Today you can take that and apply it to economic differences in the church. We've been in churches before where we had millionaires and we've had people who were just laborers. You have all kinds of economic... Look in our church. There's a lot of economic disparity between people. A lot of us are on fixed incomes. We're older. There are other people who are doing really well and probably have more money than we do. But it's not something that should divide the church. But we also have divisions based on race. We have divisions based on ethnicity. We can have divisions over anything. But Christianity is a religion, is a belief system that says everybody is equal. Five to seven. Canette, would you read those, please? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? Okay. In verse 5, mine starts off with listen. Mm -hmm. So he's given, the, he's given the problem in verse 1. He's given the example in verses 2, 3, and 4. Now he's going to give the teaching. 
So listen up. My dear brothers, there's that term again, all you Jewish believers, all those who say you are Christians, didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? How many of you remember the parable of the rich young ruler? Mm -hmm. And how did it end? He walked away. He walked away. Because and what did this Jesus say to the disciples? It is easier, easier. for a camel to go through easier the eye for a camel to go through the eye of the needle and a rich man to come into God. the kingdom. Why? The rich have no need. They have it all. Or that can be the attitude. You know, why do I need religion? I have lots of money. I live in a nice house. We're all healthy. You know, why do I need religion? On the other hand, you got the poor who don't have anything. Maybe they are looking for the riches that come from belief because yeah. they inherit the rich in heaven. Go back to the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they come on. They will inherit the kingdom. I know you guys know this. So they will inherit the kingdom. Poor in spirit. Not necessarily poor in material goods, but poor and willing to accept God's kingdom and the riches that he provides. Pages are stuck together. Verse 6 said, Yet you dishonor that poor man. You pay attention to the rich and you ignore the poor guy. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you in the courts? Verse 6 and 7, James lays out the problem or the error of their ways if they are the ones who are paying attention to the rich but not the poor. So he starts off by saying, don't the rich oppress you. So number one, the rich face a charge here. If you're a rich person back then and you listen to the news, some of it occurs today, but it says here, don't the rich oppress you. And what they're talking about here is exploiting them for economic gain. How many articles have you read in the paper about how much a CEO makes versus the worker bee? Or the guy who is a day laborer or works in a fast food joint and cannot make ends meet because he doesn't get a living wage. That's a whole different subject we spend on nine over. I'm not going there. But just what he's talking about here is why are you being so nice to the rich? if they are the ones who are, in fact, oppressing you economically. And then he says, and drags you into court. So that's the second charge against the rich. They drag you into court. Think of the story of Paul and Silas with the slave girl in Philippi. The owners of the slave girl dragged them into court because of what they did. They freed her from the demon and they lost their livelihood. So they dragged them in the court. Well, you look at the history of Christianity in the first few centuries, and there were many times that Christians were persecuted in the courts of the day, or what amounted to the courts of the day. But then the third charge in verse 7, don't they blaspheme the noble name that you bear? In other words, again, the rich have no need for religion. At least... He's making the charge that they don't think they have a need for religion. In point of fact, rich or poor have a need for a faith in Christ. But evidently the people they were inviting into their church, into their meetings, didn't necessarily come because of any faith. They came because of who was there. Then he goes on in 8 through 13 and gives us the remedy for it. 
So, John, would you read 8 through 13, please? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay. So verse 8 says, if you really care, if you really carry out the royal law prescribed in Scripture. Well, what's the royal law prescribed in Scripture? Well, Christ was asked, what's the greatest commandments? Love your neighbor. So what were the two great commandments? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God mm -hmm. and love your neighbor as yourself. And since Christ is the king of everything, it becomes a royal law or a royal commandment and he's giving him some credit if in fact if in fact you are carrying out the scripture and he gives it to him you shall love your neighbor as yourself you're doing pretty good but there's always a but in scripture if you're doing it well and good but if you are not but if you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. You break one law, you've broken them all. Mm. Verse 10 says, For whoever keeps the entire law yet fails in one point is guilty of breaking it all. I like the analogy one of the commentaries gave. It said, God's law is not like a setup of ten bowling pins, which we knock down one at a time. It's more like a plane of glass. You break one part, the whole thing shatters. God's law is in totality. There's a unity there. If you break one, then you have broken them all. And he goes on at 11 to say, For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you're a lawbreaker. You could argue, are there some sins that are big sins and some sins that are little sins? Me talking. If it's a sin, it's a sin. Not big sin, not little. Yeah, some are more heinous than others. You know, I would not equate taking a ballpark pin from your office home with murdering somebody. But James is telling us, Christ tells us in the Gospels, Paul tells us in his letters, a sin is a sin is a sin. Any of those are transgressions. And showing favoritism, he says here, is a transgression. You are not living up to what you say you believe in. Speak and act as those who will be judged by the law of freedom. Christ in the Gospels said that the, what he says will set you free. So if you believe, then you have been set free from all of those prejudices, all of those things that you used to do. You're now free from those for judgment is without mercy to the one who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We are not the ones who are called on to judge. Christians today, I'm going to go a little off script and probably get in trouble. Christians today in many quarters are known as a judgmental people because of the way we present our beliefs. Are many of the things we're judging 
Are we judging them correctly? I would say yes, we are judging correctly. But remember what Christ said. I believe it's in chapter 3 of John. I did not come to judge the world. I came to serve. save the world. Or to serve works too, but save is where I was going. We're not called on to judge. We're called on to present our faith and how it applies across the board. And it's not our point, me talking, to judge. Christianity in the early centuries grew and developed as quickly as it did in a environment of hostility because of the moral practices that they did. Culture of that day was very much showing partiality, very much saying, if you're rich and can influence something for me, then I'm going to be real nice to you. And if you're lower in economic status or political power, I'm not going to have anything to do with you because you don't benefit me from anything. That was the culture of the day. I'd say in many ways it hasn't changed all that much. The lives of the early Christians showed that they cared for everyone regardless of social, economic status of any type. The church was made up of the rich and the slave, just like that church in Kenya. It's made up of the people from Embassy Row from the people from Kabera, which has a million people living in huts made out of cardboard and tin. Mm -hmm. And it was one church. The reality of our faith, test number four, the reality of our faith is how we treat others regardless of economics, social, ethnic, or any other division you might want to bring in. That is the proof of whether or not we have a genuine and a fruitful belief. Okay, I'm done preaching. <laughs> Anybody comment, question, something you want to add? The only thing I got, James, is that, like, as Christians and, and so many people, when you're called to, uh, how do I say this? If you, it, we're called to hold people accountable and share mm -hmm. our faith. And then they, how do you do that without actually them taking you and judging them? I mean, it's a slippery slope, I guess. It's a slippery slope, yeah. I would say that we have to present in a non judgmental way. <laughs> The judgment of the Bible. Right. You know, this is what fact. Scripture says. This is what we believe. I get it. How many times have I said you are free to interpret Scripture yourself? You know, this is how I read what the Scripture says. I think what you did was wrong. You have to interpret Scripture for yourself. But we have to do it in such a way that we're not using a two by four on their head, telling them, that they're going to hell because of what they did. Right. That's, again, this is me talking. That's not our place. Our place is to present, and then it's up to the Spirit and God to do the convicting mm -hmm. and the judging, ultimately, because ultimately we're all going to be judged, whether it's before God's throne or Christ's throne. We're all going to get judged. Thank you. Does that help at all? It does. It does. But I think too often today Christians are seen as having a two-by-four rather than having the idea of mercy and um, love. and love, yeah. And, and you get me off on, on politics, we're really going to trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right, don't then, well, it is right there in the scripture. I'm sorry? It is right here in black and white mm -hmm. that mercy triumphs over judgment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. I think what we have to understand what I need to understand is most people, most people are doing the best they can 
with what they know at the time. And um, sometimes it's really easy to judge people thinking they should know better when they really don't. Mm -hmm. And so mercy goes a long way to cover these issues. Uh, you go to the hearing when he's talking about, you know, don't commit adultery, don't murder. If you did one, you've done them all. <clears throat> if we were perfect, you could judge. Mm -hmm. We ain't perfect. Yeah. Hmm. The only one capable of being perfect and judging is yeah. God himself. Don't you think that a lot of people think we are judging them? Yes. Yeah. But I think it's the way we come across because it's the way we present it. But it could also be their conviction. It could also be they're convicted by what you... Again, how you do it... I'm no expert on that. <laughs> a, minute, a minute ago I said we have to... How did I say it? Judge, judge them mercifully. <laughs> but inside the church and outside the church is different. So we, looking outside of the church, we're not supposed to judge. But within the church, like, Lily should hold me accountable mm -hmm. that she sees me not doing what I'm supposed to. It is her job to turn me back and say, mm -hmm. hey. And so that word is very yeah, there's, hard. I don't remember offhand exactly where it is, but there's a place in the New Testament where it talks about if you turn a believer back from his sin, you've done a good thing. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. So yeah, Christians should hold Christians accountable. Mm -hmm. We should also, I'm off script again, we should also hold society accountable. Right. But we need to remember, particularly in the United States, that society is multifaceted and what we believe is not necessarily what somebody else mm -hmm. believes. Mm -hmm. So how we hold them accountable I don't know the right answer to that. We need to give it in our, in how we see it, but we need to also ex expect that other people may not see it exactly the way they do because of their either faith be beginnings, the different religion they belong to. Um, I don't know. It, I don't have an easy way of doing it. I've heard another way of saying it. It's better to err with mercy. Yeah. Again, the U.S. is a multicultural, multi-religious nation, and not everybody believes the same as we do as Christians. We should present, maybe talking again, we should present our beliefs, but understand that not everybody agrees with our beliefs. But the seed's been planted. If you if you come at the right way, the seed's been planted, and then the Lord can, can do the conviction, and then hopefully yes. that's enough to change them. Yes, that doesn't stop us from sharing the gospel no. because the Great Commission says we can share it. We just have to be merciful when we share it. And again, I don't have a, I don't have a one, two, three step for you. I'm just saying that that's where we need to go. And it should be uh, according to James here across the board. We should not just share with the rich. We should share for the homeless. We should share. You know, again, look at our church on Wednesday nights. A lot of time, even Sunday mornings, we have homeless that come in, and they hear the word, they get a meal, they get food out of the pantry. Mm -hmm. We are we are acting on our beliefs. That's what James calls us to do. The other kind of visitation, it was back in the early 80s, it was strictly about, we'd all gather, meet, mm -hmm. pray on us, but um, we went in groups and we were knocking on doors all around here mm -hmm. and it, doing two things of inviting them to church and also sharing Christ. Mm -hmm. There'd be somebody bold enough to, in the little group to can initiate it and we had people that would listen. Yeah. yeah. But the world's a different place now. The world's a different you place now. Knock on doors anymore. People uh -huh. won't open them. Yeah. A lot of times they won't open the door. Or they, well, I won't. they're afraid of who's at the door. Uh -huh. I won't. If I don't know who's, if yeah. I look out, if I don't know him, I don't know. Okay, anybody else? Something to add? Might be Paul. I'm the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Might be somebody's name is Paul. <laughs> you know, that's, for sure. that's one advantage of having a ring doorbell. You can see who's at your door. That's not a plug for a ring because I don't have a ring. I have another type of doorbell with a camera, but that's the reason for having a camera on your doorbell to see you ring your door. <laughs> okay, let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson from the book of James. 
Help us to apply it to our lives and to understand that it is flat ground at the foot of the cross. That in your kingdom, all are equal. All have access to the Father through you, through faith. Help us to understand that for those who are not part of the family, that we need to be merciful, but we also need to be bold in our witness and allow you to work in their lives rather than us trying to do it all. Keep us safe now. May we have a good evening and be back on Sunday. We ask it in your name. Amen. 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 Amen.